sure. It's Bill Castanier, B-I-L-L. Castanier is C-A-S-T-A-N-I-E-R. And I am the president of the Historical Society of Greater Lansing. Okay, well, they, first, they've been well documented. Um, just in the last couple of years, there's been at least three books written about the disaster two nonfiction and one fiction. And uh, Arnie Bernstein, of course, is probably, I, I would think, if I had to say the best history of it, that's where I would go to, to learn about the actual facts of it. Um, but this is a story that began way before the explosion on May 18th. Uh, it began with um, a farmer. Uh, who was educated. I mean, not that the farmers aren't educated, but he typically there's stereotypes about things, and he was an educated farmer. Um, but he collected grievances, and that's, I think, characteristic of people who do these kinds of things. They, they feel they're slighted, they internalize them, and they just build up on them. And he was an elected official who got defeated uh, for a post. Uh, the Bass School uh, went into a, one of the consolidated school systems, which meant they were going more regional. And to do that, they had to raise the taxes. And he was already uh, had difficult financial difficulties. He had difficulties at home. Um, and his answer was clearly, because he had access, he was somewhat of a janitor on the school board. He had access to that building. And he began wiring it with dynamite, which sounds bizarre in today's world, but dynamite back then was readily available. You could buy it at basically hardware stores. And <clears throat> he used an immense amount of dynamite. Uh, he practiced at his own farm, which is just down the road from the Bass School. And one of the things that he did, he would sneak in at night and he began uh, planting the dynamite in, in the school. Um, and he had quite an extensive um, he was a very clever man. He was quite technologically uh, perceptive, so he knew what he was doing, but the good news was he made a mistake <laughs> on the, some of the connections. But he wired the dynamite. It was set on a clock to go off at a certain time. Uh, the morning it went off, he first began doing damage to his own farm, killing animals, things like that. And later it was found out he had killed a spouse and left her body on the farm. Uh, but he set it off. Um, for a time when all the kids would be at school. Now what he didn't recognize is a lot of kids weren't at school because it was kind of like finals week. And one of the things that kids could do, they opted out even back then. If they had got good grades, they didn't have to go in. So there was a lot of kids that weren't there to begin with. Um, and so he said at a particular period of time, so it would, when it went off, it would do the most damage and would kill people. I mean, he didn't just do damage to a physical structure. His idea was to kill people, to get attention. Um, obviously, it was a very warped individual that that was going to have any impact and not that he wouldn't be hated. So when it exploded, uh, you could hear that. Reports were you could hear it as far as Lansing because of the massive amount of dynamite. And people began emerging on the scene almost immediately. I mean, it was that fast. <coughs> Excuse me. And then two of the factories in Lansing closed down, Rio and Oldsmobile, and sent their workers out here to start some of the recovery work. That was almost immediately. Uh, one of the more interesting things that I've come across, and it's in private collector's hands, it's the logbook of the City of Lansing Fire Department, and it gives the time, I forgot exactly when it was, it was 902, I could look it up for you, but it logs in, call from Bass Schools, and that's you know emergency, that's basically all it said. And so the police <coughs> fire department began coming out here from Lansing. Uh, because as you can guess, this was a very small community. They didn't really have the ability to fight fires or respond to emergencies. But when they arrived here, they saw that it was bigger than even them and called in, <coughs> called in departments from all over. Uh, it was mostly volunteer forces that began picking through the rugged, the, uh, the destruction and saving people's, actual saving people's lives. And it was quite heroic because it was dangerous to be on the site. Especially, they did not, not know at the time that the other part of the building was wired still. And when they did discover that, and some very heroic people went in there and dismantled the, the dynamite so it wouldn't blow. Um, but it was uh, <clears throat> almost immediately then the thing that happened is media started descending on this. It came from all, literally all over the world, uh, which was not uncommon for, for a response 
to disasters. They would send in crews of both film, print, photographers. They would take trains, planes. Planes were pretty, just relatively new. Uh, and automobiles and get here within, within hours to start covering this. And this coverage was in virtually every newspaper in the United States and overseas. Uh, front page news about this disaster which killed 30, 38 students and then a number of adults. So <clears throat> the media coverage was immense and the other thing that happened very quickly within a day was you started to get to the disaster tourists, which they're called today, which if, <clears throat> if you've been following the news about that serial killer on Long Island, people are now going to his house to, to take a look at it. And that happened out here. There, would, there was reports of, it's, which is hard to imagine, of up to 50,000 to 60,000 cars on the highway here, coming out here. And these were almost dirt roads. So people would wait hours and hours just to drive by the school. So the state police responded, other police units responded to kind of get people off the site. And it was, a, as reports were there, and some of the report, some of the photography was pretty grim, uh, showing body parts and things like that. It was that era of media that probably wouldn't happen today, but back then it was pretty awesome, uh, uh, not awesome, gruesome, rather, um, depiction of the news. Uh, many families lost more than one child. Um, the survivors f felt guilt almost through their whole life, that why, that why me, why did I survive and my brother didn't. Um, others traced their you know, family tree back to, uh, they, they survived and they grew up, got married, but they still remember the day of the disaster. That's not uncommon. People in their, well, they'd be in their 70s now, the second, the, some of the kids, you know, the, or second generation kids. That they're, and they're, what they remember is their parents never talked about it and never allowed it to be talked about in the house. That whole generational grief is something that's pretty remarkable, and I think we're just starting to understand it. That you just did not talk about it, and they were forbidden to talk about it. Which when I learned that, I thought, wow, this was just something that was kept very quiet until the mass murders at schools. And somebody, uh, I think, modern day media, you know, it pops up. And it's going to continue to pop up because it's in databases now. So if you put in mass killings at schools, if one of the, probably one of the first or second things is probably the Bass School disaster. And um, what have you noted about uh, the second generation now and the, the museum? What do you? Well, I think <clears throat> I think they've come to grips, and it's been painful for them that they want to create a memorial, a memoriam to the to the victims and to tell that story for future generations so it's not forgotten. Um, it's kind of like the Vietnam Wall when it was first gone, when it first went up. It was very controversial. But I think, uh, I think they want to find a way now to respectfully tell that story so it's never forgotten. You know, it's kind of like the name on the wall. Um, the victims' names are always remembered, always respected, always revered. And that's something I think we need to do more as a country, frankly, when things like this happen. We have to recognize the, the tragedy and who, who, who is involved with it and how it passes down from generation to generation. And, I mean, all these kids who are just getting, they were just getting started in life. I mean, oh, they were young, yeah. yeah. They were very young. Um, got up that morning to go to school, took their lunches with them, you know, getting ready to go on the playground and didn't make it to mid-morning break. And there was... I, it's hard to imagine the tragedy of the scene when people arrived on it. it I, it's because there were people crying, yelling, screaming, you know, the, the survivors. And then people immediately started digging in the, remain, the remains of the building to get people out. And, and there were some tra very traumatic things that were found, you know, teachers covering the students and things like that or trying to protect them from falling walls. So. It had the makings of every tragedy that we hear about today. And why do you think it's so important right now to give a voice to the voiceless for the, the children? That Hopefully, you know, there's that old maxim about history repeats itself or doesn't repeat itself. But Mark Twain once said, I think it rhymes. And I think there's something to be learned from that. I think we can, we, we are starting to learn about 
people who collect grievances and who become perpetrators, and that's important. But I think it's more important to, to put focus on both the people that died at the scene and also survivors. Um, I think there's healing in that way, and it's generational healing. And we're a relatively young country. Um, you know, the last war was the Civil War in our country, and that goes back a long time and mostly fought in the South, so we don't really know it about it in the North. Um, other countries are going through it all the time now. Every day you watch TV or the news, similar things are happening, except they're perpetrated by another country. But the single madman or the lone gunman is still happening. It's very common, as we all know, because we just pick up the newspaper or watch TV. It's there virtually every day. Uh, hopefully we learn and we respect and also try to find ways to stop it. What do you think the future of the, um, of the community looks like? I mean, do you expect um, more people to talk about it in the future? I think they are talking about it. I've noticed that just in the last five years since they've had their anniversary, their major anniversary, that they filled the Bass School, you know, the Bass School Auditorium. They weren't sure how many people would be there. Uh, absolutely filled it and there were individual witnesses that came up and talked about their, the second generation. People like Arnie tracked down original voices. There's a documentary being done right now that's probably going to end up on a platform like Netflix. It's being done by a group of filmmakers in Lansing um, and they've got quite a bit of money behind it. It's not, it's not amateur at all. It's, it, I've seen it and it's dramatic and when that hits the screen, which could be as early as this fall, I'm not positive, I haven't been keeping an eye on it that close, it's, go it's going to come up again. And it's, the, you know, part of that is that whole PTSD, that tragedy repeats itself, and that's, that's going to happen. And I hope, I hope before they issue that film here locally, they really work with the community to understand what they're going to see. Uh, to just drop it on them, I don't think would be fair. And I know the people doing it, and they're very respectful. And they've got early interviews with some of the survivors and things like that. And um, they've just done a lot of, it's a, one of those dramatic reenactments. So they built structures to blow up and things like that. It's, it's dramatic. Um, and I think it's, it's definitely going to be on some platform. Uh, and there's no question about it. Is there anything that you want to say that we missed maybe about um, any of the victims, the survivors, um, anything that you think? Well, I think um, relatively recently the survivors, when they became aged, started talking about it. They did feel like they, had, they owed that looking back to start, and they opened up. And that was pretty important to do, and I've seen that in other tragedies where people refuse to talk about something until they're in their 80s, 90s, and in one case, uh, 100s. Um, if we could get people, I think, you know, if, if this happened... Um, to contemporaneously, there'd be counselors on the site that day. You know, it's just what happens now. And that wasn't the case back then. Those people had to live through their own grief. Um, and I think we're better at it now, um, especially because of mass murders. We're much, much better at it. And there's, there's people that have been trained in this kind of thing that they fly in from all over the country now to help deal with this. It's just, we are better at response. What we're not good at is, is stopping it. And we haven't figured that out yet. Do you think, um, I mean, towards the end of their lives, the survivors kind of started opening up more because they realized um, they wanted to respect? I think. Oh, absolutely. I think. I think they understand a couple of things. They wanted the story to be known and told from a first person because there's there's nothing like the first person uh, recitation of what happened. There is nothing like that. They are so emotional when you are directly talking to a person that something happened to, and it was emotional for them. And I think they wanted to leave that kind of legacy of, here's what actually happened, and here's how it affected the community. And that's, I think the community understood that. It was very emotional, that anniversary thing they had. It was, there was, I don't know how big that auditorium is, 300, I'm not even sure anymore. But it was packed with people, and it was dynamic. And I think those are important important times to talk about, no matter what the tragedy is. And it could be something as dislocation. You know, your home was taken away from you in great numbers. And uh, those things are important to talk to, talk about publicly, I think. They shouldn't be held within, but that's the common way people respond. They don't, 
they don't respond to grief in that way. So I hopefully, hopefully that's going to change because maybe that from that we learn, and that's part of what history is about is learning. That's all I have. That's good. Thank yeah. you. You're good. Thanks. Let me make a note of two things I got to send you. <laughs> Time. I okay. Know it's hard, but pretend like the camera's not I'd rather look at you than the camera. <laughs> All right, so um, first, can you say and spell your first and last name for me? Susan Hagerman, S U S A N H A G E R M A N. And what would your title be here? I'm the president of the Basque Museum Committee. Okay. And you said your father survivor. Yes, my father. Uh, two aunts and an uncle, okay. and another aunt that was in the church. So um, <coughs> tell me a little bit about the history of the school, when it became a consolidated school, like you're telling me you were there. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Originally, there was um, a smaller school there, like one of the one-room school buildings in the park. And then they added on to that and made it grades eight through 10. What they did was they just built right around the, um, the old school there. But they made a brick two-story building and because it was grades eight through 10, um, the, t the teachers had to be, have more education. And so it was an, like it was an accredited school. Um, and so the, it was a better school the one-room school buildings, the classes only went up to the eighth grade. Uh, one of the reasons that they made that first building, that was built in 1873, I believe it was. Very old. Very old, yeah. And then um, that was a brick building. And then they decided to build a bigger school and make it K through 12. So that was called the Bath Consolidated School. Um, there was a lot of controversy with, over the time period because some people said, well, we don't need that big of a school. It's going to cost a lot of money. And, and um, they used the reasoning that that way uh, the kids could all be together in one place. They'd have the same friends all through school. They would have public transportation. The children would be bused in from their homes way out in the country. They wouldn't have to walk in the winter anymore. And there would not be the 10 or 11 individual one-room school buildings all over the community, all over the district. And so uh, they got that going, and then they decided uh, they wanted to build a bigger school. <laughs> so what they did was around that two-story brick school building, they just built right around that and added on to it to make the Bath Consolidated School. And that was in 1922. And that was grades K through 12. And uh, so it was going along nicely. Um, that's about the time Kehoe came into, uh, into town. And he was very friendly with everybody. He, um, he was on the school board. He was actually the treasurer of the school board. He, um, he held a, a township office for a while, but then was not reelected. Um, he and his wife, Nellie, had a beautiful farm about a quarter of a mile out north or west of Bath. And it was one of the finest ones in the community because uh, Nellie's father and his, her whole family was wealthy because they uh, were part of the General Motors buildings that were built in Lansing. So there was a lot of money there. <clears throat> and uh, so Kehoe and Nellie moved into that house. And uh, then the school um, started wanting more things, raising more taxes. They wanted to make a football field. So they did that. So that cost extra money. And then they thought, well, we've got this football field. Now we need lights so that they can play you know, in the dark. And that was going to cost money to have a power plant. And so Kehoe was really getting very, very angry by now. Um, Superintendent Hike was always was one to want to make things better 
to move into the future and have um, more education, better education. And he is actually the one that got the school accredited through the University of Michigan. Um, so that made it even better. They were able to get uh, more, uh, I don't know, funding, maybe school funding because of that. Uh, so Kehoe and Mr. Hike, every time there was a board meeting, they were after each, they were at each other. Kehoe objected to everything that Hike wanted. And if he didn't get what he wanted, he would say, let's just adjourn the meeting. And so um, he was getting a bit of a reputation of being a hard head. And then um, the, uh, Kehoe was a farmer, but not a good farmer. He, had, he was actually had a degree in engineering that he had gotten from, it was called Michigan College back then, it's Michigan State University today. And uh, he would go out in his fields dressed in his suit, his white shirt, vest, uh, suit, coat, go out and ride on his tractor. If he got dirty, he would go in and change his clothes. Not a typical farmer. No, no. That, they called him a gentleman farmer. Did not take care of crops. Um, and just nobody could understand. He had all of this wonderful acreage and all this good land, and he never uh, did anything with it, really. And one time he was out with his horses, and he was, a very, he was very cruel with his animals. He, he drove this horse. He didn't let it rest all day. He just drove it and drove it until it just dropped. And so he just killed it. And then uh, he had the neighbors across the road had a dog that one time went in his yard and was barking, and so he shot it. And so then the neighbors said, you know, we'll just stay away from him now. So there were very early signs that he was not. He was not a friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> the uh, house was going to be put into foreclosure because he was not paying the, the house payments on it. And uh, he blamed the people of Bath because the taxes were so high he couldn't afford to do anything. So um, he, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, he, uh, That's okay. I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> I just drew a blank. You can blot that part out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this will be edited. Yeah. Um, the house went into foreclosure, but the family didn't want to shut it down because Nellie lived there. And, uh, you know, she was the daughter, the granddaughter, the niece, and they wanted to be sure that she was taken care of. And also, Nellie had health issues. Some, you know, she was in the hospital a lot, a lot of doctor visits. It was something with her lungs. Some people say it was tuberculosis, but I don't know if that was ever validated. Okay. Uh, but That's she right. had a, a lung disease of some type. So um, this uh, Kehoe had, uh, was very experienced in doing several things, uh, maintenance and, and repair work and stuff, especially with wiring. So um, he had access to the school because periodically they would ask him to help out because they knew he could do different things. And he was willing to do that. He was also um, an expert with dynamite. Back then, the farmers used dynamite to blow stumps to clear fields for farming for their crops. And so he got started ordering big amounts of dynamite and pyrotol. And if they asked him about it, he would just say, well, what I don't use, I'll sell to my neighbors for them to use for their fields. So nobody really questioned it because it was that era. So uh, he would stockpile dynamite. And because he had access to the schools, at night uh, he would go in, and I don't know exactly when he started doing this. It may have been a month. I, I don't know. He would go in at night, <clears throat> go into the basement, and put dynamite and pyrotol in the walls and under the floors. Um, it would be the ceiling of the basement. And he planted a total of 1,000 pounds 
of dynamite. And uh, he set the timer to go off at 8.45 in the morning on, this, on May 18th. It was the last real school day of the year. The kids were um, taking finals. The, one, the ones that had a B average or higher did not have to take exams. So not everybody was there. The school had 236 uh, children admitted, that, you know, that were recorded in school, but they were not all, not all there that day. Um, so that was his plan. He was going to get rid of the kids and get back at the parents and teach them a lesson. He was going to kill all their children. So then, um, he, sorry, I got to, sorry. Um, so he had that all planted and had it all set to go. And uh, he also had planted dynamite in his house, all his barns all around his area. Um, he cut trees, his fruit trees, so that, uh, and then set them back on the trunk so that um, they would not produce fruit. They would just die because he did not want anybody to have, to be able to use them, to have anything to do with them. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, his wife had come home from the hospital that mm, the, must have been the, 17th and uh, she was very well known in the community and, and everybody really liked her. She was really nice. And so uh, people would question him, well, how's Nellie doing? Is she, is she at home now? And, well, I took her to Jackson to visit some friends. So she's not at home right now. Well, they thought that was reasonable. So nobody questioned that. Well, in reality, um, she, he killed her we don't know for sure. Uh, I guess we'll never know absolutely for sure. But um, how he did it, uh, if he killed her or if he just tied her up and she burned. When they finally found her remains, they did find a blunt force trauma in her head where he had hit her with something. So the inquest concluded that he hit her and killed her before the fact. So uh, he tied her body to a, a, a cart axle out in the backyard and then placed some of the silverware and some of her jewelry around her body. I don't know why he did that. Um, and then... Uh, he went up to the school and was greeting the children as they walked in. Now that day was, on, on morning of May 18th, was a really beautiful day. It had rained the night before, and so it was fresh, and the air was clean, and it was just really nice. The kids were all excited about it being the last real day of school. And because of that, the ones that didn't have to take exams, the teachers would just read them stories. So <clears throat> the kids got into school, the teachers were starting to read stories. Some of the classrooms switched with other classrooms, uh, the ones that were taking exams. I don't remember the reasoning, maybe because it was more lighting for the kids to take their exams if they were in a different classroom. Um, but anyway, they had switched some classrooms. Some teachers were reading, some were taking exams. Um, at 8.45, the first timer went off. Kehoe had left by this time. And nobody that was in it, any of, the, any of the survivors that had talked about it over the years, the little they did talk about it, nobody remembered hearing the boom of the explosion. And I think that's just part of the trauma, that you don't remember something like that. They said the floor went up and the ceiling came down and one, the whole north end of the school from the middle to the north end of the school. And that was mostly the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders was the, the majority that was involved. Because of that explosion, uh, it jarred the timer on the other half of the school 
So that timer did not go off, only by the grace of God. That end of the school did not blow up. Had it blown up, the whole building would have gone and people have said it would have taken the whole township, the whole bath town, which was like three blocks away. Um, nobody really understood what had happened. Uh, plaster, debris was everywhere. Smoke and dust from the plaster was in the air. And by the time people started coming up, um, they realized what had happened. Uh, the operator that was in the, the, uh, the, the, there was a store downtown that had a room with an operator in it, and she put out the emergency alert to Lansing, calling for any help that they could get to get out here that the school had been blown up. Um, people that lived four, five, six miles out of town heard the explosion, felt it, uh, there was one farmer that was uh, working in the field with his horses and it scared them so bad they ran off while he was working with them. Um, so people started coming up and they started uh, trying to dig through the debris and they were running up there, where's my child? I want, him, I want my child, is he or she safe? Um, they started pulling bodies out. Uh, injured children. They made a temporary morgue on the front lawn of the school. The whole community came out. The whole community, the whole community, everybody came up. Frantic. Um, well, in the meantime, his Kehoe's house had blown up and uh, people were running there to put it out. And he actually drove out of his driveway and said, never mind this, you need to get up to the school. Because he, he wanted them to be up there too. So uh, while people were trying to save furniture and things in his house, before it burned completely, they discovered there was dynamite in the drawers, under the carpet, all around the house and somebody found it and says, get out now. And so they got out and all his buildings burned. Um, nobody knew where Mellie was at that time. They were still thinking she was visiting. Um, but back up at the school, they were getting blankets and sheets and whatever they could find for bandages, blankets to cover the bodies. Parents would come up looking for their children. Sometimes they were so mangled they had to just look at their shoes to identify them that way. Um, they worked all day digging bodies and children out. Uh, when Kehoe drove back up by the school and saw Mr. Hike, who was his main person he wanted dead, he was standing out in the yard helping. Um, so Mr. Hike, or uh, Kehoe, drove his truck up to the front of the school. He had filled the back end of his truck with shrapnel, um, metal, pieces of metal, shards of glass, whatever he could find, and put some dynamite in there. He drove up and uh, got out and called Mr. Hike over to the truck and shot into the back of the truck and blew it up, killing himself. Mr. Hike, uh, the postmaster, uh, and there was uh, there were a couple other people that were injured. One woman bystander had a piece of metal go through her eye. She lost her eye. Um, another one had an injury to his leg, and I believe later on he died from that. Um, there was one little boy who had survived the explosion in the school, was out in the yard and was killed when the truck blew up. My dad and my two aunts were buried under the rubble. My dad was in the third grade, it was third, fourth overflow grade. Miss Weatherby taught that. 
That was her first year of teaching. She looked like one of the students. She looked so young. Um, one aunt was in the fifth grade, and one aunt was in the sixth grade. Uh, my dad was buried. He said when he came to, all he could see was a little light shining up above him. He kept calling out for the janitor to come and help. Nobody came, nobody heard him. And then he's, he started thinking, um, well, what did I do this morning? Just to give him something to think about. So he went over his mind. Okay, we, we got up, we had breakfast, we did the chores, we walked to school, and then he said, after that, he doesn't remember anything, so he must, have, he must have blacked out. And the next thing he knew, he was being pulled from the rubble. He had plaster in his ears, in his mouth, his nose, his eyes, everywhere. He had blood, he had injuries, you know, little lacerations all over him. Um, later on, it was discovered he had broken his leg. Um, my aunt, one aunt broke her leg, uh, another aunt was pinned against a radiator and, uh, for a while until they got her rescued. My other uncle that was not injured was in the first grade, the end of the building that did not get damaged, so he was okay. I had another aunt who was a senior that year. They were practicing in the Methodist church, which was just right next to where the school was. The seniors were practicing for commencement, which was supposed to be the next day. The explosion jarred the, the, the church. It blew it off its foundation. All the windows were broken, uh, but nobody was injured in it. Windows and houses all over town were broken. There was one house that was um, in the same yard the front yard of the school, there was a house there, and um, it got so damaged they had to tear it down. Um, my, they, my uncle, or my dad, was taken out to the front yard, and he sat next to a tree, and uh, that's when Kehoe drove the car up. Blew his car up, it scared my dad so bad, he jumped up, ran across the road, to his aunt's house, okay. not realizing he had a broken leg. And then uh, it was a while later, his mother drove him into the hospital. I, I never heard of any, any more about my two aunts. Um, I'm sure their kids had those stories. I don't know if they went into the hospital with them, they must have. Um, they just kept, they kept Digging through debris, the people were digging through the debris. Uh, the police got there and they were trying to identify Kehoe. There were, he was blown to bits. Person, a home across the road, one lady was in her backyard and she found part of him there, it had his. Uh, uh, identification on him so they knew for sure that it was him. Uh, the, the cleanup went on all day. They got part way through the cleanup when somebody found some more unexploded dynamite. So the, the state police called a halt to all the cleanup, which nobody wanted to stop. They wanted to find their kids, but they had to stop for a while. Um, they had to try to find all the dynamite. They, uh, the hole they found to go into that was available to get into the basement was so small, none of the firemen, the police, nobody, none of the rescuers were small enough to fit into that hole. So one of the high school students who was small in stature volunteered to go in and he pulled it all out. And so they got it all out. There was another 500 pounds that had not exploded. Um, they uh, continued cleaning up and uh, continued pulling bodies and injured out. By then, people from Lansing, from all over, had heard about this. They were driving out to see it. 
traffic was so heavy, ambulances were having trouble getting from the site into the Lansing to get to the hospital. There, there was thousands and thousands. By Sunday, this happened on a Thursday, by Sunday, um, it was said there was like 50,000 people that had gone through sightseers. Uh, there's one story that people would come with a blanket and have a picnic and sit and watch them cleaning it up. Um, people would go into, you know, they'd try to get souvenirs. They moved the, the temporary morgue from the front lawn to one of the buildings downtown. People were sightseers, were driving, going downtown, trying to get into the building to see the bodies. It was just horrible. Uh, of course, there's still chaos. People are still, they're mourning, you know. Um, they did finally get it all cleaned up. Uh, people were going around Kehoe's farm, looking at that just as much as they were at the site of the school building. It was the next day, I believe, before anybody realized what they were looking at by those wheels was actually Nellie's charred body and uh, she was, her arms were tied to the wheels and um, they, some of the pictures we have in our displays they show there's a canvas over that area so you can't see her. But people had been walking by all day long the day before, nobody knew that was her. The horses, uh, Kehoe had tied into the barn, tied their feet together so they couldn't get away. They were all killed. All his animals were killed. Um, there's just no sense. Uh, they, and while searching around the property, uh, they found a little plaque that with, had stenciled the letters in. It was fastened on a fence on his, in the back of his um, farm. Criminals are made, not born. Uh, there was an inquest to uh, find out what really happened, to make sure that there was nobody like from the school board, anyone from town that was involved. Uh, it cleared everybody. They, they uh, judged that Kehoe acted alone, that he was the only one involved. Um, the, the funerals started uh, Friday and there would be like five or six a day and people that had lost children would go to the funerals of their friends to help support them. Traffic was so bad that the police I believe had to close one road down so that the people could go and have their funerals. One sightseer actually looked into the house of one of the families that had lost three children. Um, and it was just terrible. <laughs> you don't want to believe that there's evil in the world, but this. Yeah, I know. It was just. It said that uh, when he was, um, oh, probably in his twenties, maybe he was an adult. He had a job somewhere in another town, and he had fallen off a ladder and hit his head, and I believe was unconscious for a few days. Some people are saying that that may have been what triggered, something may have happened in his brain that made him, yeah, mentally, yeah. Mentally capable person. Yes. So right, but, you know, it's still... And you were saying um, a lot of dynamite didn't go off. I mean, 
that's got to sit with you every day. I mean, if, if they had you, oh. you might Oh, yeah. Might yeah. Um, I have, uh, when Walt comes and talks, he'll share his dad's side. But if his, his dad very nearly could have been killed, if he had been killed, there would have been a whole branch of my family not here today. But I'm sure he'll cover that in his story. But, um, yeah, and they rebuilt. The, the families of the township were strong. They knew they had to push forward. They still had families to take care of. They still had farms to run, animals to take care of. And they just went back to their life. Um, a few of the families, I believe, moved out of town. They couldn't stay. They had to leave. Uh, but the majority of people stayed and just moved on. They wanted their kids to have a good education. That was the most important thing to them, that their kids get education. So right away, they started clearing out the area. The women of the town would go up and, and pull boards, or pull nails out of the boards. Uh, we have pictures of all of that. You can get shots of that. Um, so they could reuse them. And they wanted to rebuild as quickly as possible. Some people did not want it on the same site. Other people said, yes, we want it here. This is the best spot, and it needs to be here. So uh, Senator James Cousins uh, came out and uh, was looking through everything, and he donated the money to rebuild a school. Governor Green, who was the governor at that time, came out, and he was helping cleaning up. And uh, he put an announcement out to everybody these people need help, they need money. Uh, children, send your pennies in. Help these people, help these children in Bath. So pennies and, and money was coming in from all over. One of the stories is that the pennies were melted down to make the little girl with a cat statue. But that's not right. <laughs> Uh, they used the money they collected to pay to have her sculpted. They found a sculpture down in Ann Arbor, Carlton Angel. Um, he was a very well-known sculptor, and he still has pieces down there. Uh, he sculpted the little girl, used his daughter as a model, and had her hold a little cat. And that kind of depicted innocence, you know, that the children... They were important, and, and they're innocent in all of this. And when they rebuilt the James Cousins building, they built a special alcove in, in the main entrance right across from the superintendent's office for the little girl with the cat. And she sat on a pedestal for many, many, many years until um, they didn't use that school anymore. At that time, they moved her to the new high school. Um, there's stories that the students that walked into the, into the school each day would go up and just touch the little girl and know it was going to be okay that day. And uh, I've talked to two or three different people who did that. Um, uh, what else? Um, and the, the cupola, of course, uh, went back on the new building. Uh, the, the building that blew up did not have a gymnasium. Mrs. Hike donated money to help build the gymnasium. She was the superintendent Hike that was killed, and that was his wife, and she wanted to do something. So. What is it, what do you feel when you see the list of victims? I mean, there's so many. There's so many. It's, it's just very sad. Um, it's just heartbreaking because like one family lost three children. Um, my husband and I had a son pass away eight years ago. He was 46. I can't imagine losing three little children. I mean, most of the kids were seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. And they were the future of the community. Uh, 
you know, that's a whole branch of that family that's, that's died out. It's not going to grow. And um, why do you think it's so important to memorialize them here? Um, it's part of our history. Um, and you can't get rid of history. It's important for people to know about it. Uh, just because of that and how the people moved on afterwards they gathered strength nobody talked back then they didn't share feelings everybody just held everything in um, people that were involved in it if they heard a loud noise anytime the rest of their lives it would upset them my dad would start crying sometimes anytime anyone talked to him about it he would start crying even as an adult they just didn't talk about it. They held everything in. They didn't have support groups back then. They didn't have psychologists that would come out and help people. Um, but we need people to know about it because it is a part of Bath. It's a part of our history. Uh, people gathered together in strength. They moved on. And there's many survivor families in the community. I don't believe there's any actual survivors left. I believe they've all finally passed on. Um, but the families, a lot of families here in Bath, in the township, are from those families. And still, uh, when something happens, the community draws together. A couple of people have lost their homes to fire. I mean, completely burned out. And people do fundraisers, they do GoFundMe, they, they donate, and they do anything they can to help people of their community because that's what we do. These, I mean, these children were just getting started in life. They, had, yeah. they didn't know what was going on. They had no, the they came to school that morning thinking, what a beautiful day, it's the last day of school, we get the whole summer to play, we get to see our friends, some of them probably until the next school year. Um, a lot of people talked about the smell of lilacs um, from that morning, because that was the season for lilacs. And so lilacs bring a lot of memories back for, for a lot of the survivors. Um, and our, our museum committee actually just planted uh, five lilac bushes at the end of the park across the road, the James Cousins Memorial Park, because they were significant at that time. And that's what the kids thought about. You know, one little girl brought a little bouquet of lilacs, I think, to, um, to her teacher. So it was just a, another wonderful day for the kids, carefree. Parents sent their kids to school thinking they were going to be safe, come home at the end of the day. Didn't happen. Um, one of my last questions, what's, what does the future of the Bath Museum look like? You're telling me about. OK. Um, our museum here in the school is, the school has allowed us to use the lobby of the auditorium in the middle school. And we've been very blessed. They've been very cooperative. They've been very helpful in anything we do. We're out of room. There's no room to expand. Uh, so, and because of all the security involving the schools, nobody can just walk in anymore. We have to do it by appointment only during the school year um, to have people come and do tours or you know, get, just come and walk around. Uh, we're open every Saturday from 10 to 4 during the summer months. But other than that, it's not openly available to the public. So that was the one thing that, um, that and restoring the cupola that's across the road in the ground. It's over 100 years old. It's sitting out on the ground on a cement slab in the elements. And, you know, it's not going to last forever out there. So that too was one of the main things. We wanted to get it put inside where it could still be visible because people drive by. When, every day when I drive by, uh, that's the main street now on Webster Road. Every day when I drive by there, I look at the cupola. And it's just a comfort to look at that. And uh, so we need to get that inside. And so we want to build a new building across the road. Um, there will, it will be larger 
there's we have a uh, drawing up there. You can look at that. Uh, it will be a lot. We're going to make it large enough so that some of the um, display areas can be uh, expanded out. They'll have movable walls in that area. We can move the walls out and use that for our annual 50-year alumni reunion. That, uh, we invite class members from 1927 up through whatever the current year is. Um, and we, we'll have enough room for that. Uh, so that way the people won't have to come from the gymnasium here in the middle school and walk across the road because face it, most of the people that come are in their 70s and 80s and that's, you know, yeah. a little bit of a challenge <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Do you take donations here? Oh, yes. yes. We'll okay. take any donations we can get. We're nonprofit, so we have no income. Okay. So we need money to get this museum built. The goal is to have it completed and open to the public by uh, May 18th, 2027, which will be the 100 year anniversary of the explosion. And is there a website people can donate? Can they do it online? Uh, um, because I'd love to put a, a link yeah. to um, I We're working on that. I th I, can I get back with you yeah, on that? Sure. Uh, my son, who is actually, he's the spearhead, he and his wife, for the, uh, the new museum building. He's the head project manager for it. Um, he, they have gotten something set up to, so that when we sell our books or our T-shirts or whatever paraphernalia that we sell for uh, fundraising, it can be paid for um, on a code. I don't understand all of that. Yeah. I mean, if, um, but I'm sure that that will be included. So I will get back to you. I'll check with him. He's gone for the weekend, and I'll okay. get. I'll check with him on that. Yeah, we love to get the word out and, yeah. and try to get some money raised. Yeah, and also we would like to incorporate um, other community events in the new museum building. Yeah. Um, It'll be good, you know, somebody wants to have a wedding, you know, a small wedding. People go to different venues, somebody that's a real history buff, uh, you know, maybe they might want to, um, you know, just any community thing. I mean, we don't, ha we won't have big parties and stuff there, you know, but uh, we still have to respect it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and uh, we're, we're going to have it uh, where the cupola now sits. Once we get that inside, we would like to put some kind of a memorial fountain in the location where the cupola now sits and have uh, some kind of a memorial flower garden area at the end of the museum. Uh, and also the, uh, the bathrooms that we have will be available to the public from the outside of the building. So when they have um, ball games here across the road from the museum or stuff that goes on, you know, in, in the area, the public will be able to use the bathrooms. That's been a big issue with the park because there's no bathrooms there right now. So um, we have a lot of big plans. We're very excited. Uh, we're working hard to raise money for it. Yeah. Um, my last question, it's kind of a two-parter, but it's okay. put in the same answer. Um, for people like me um, who didn't know about this at all, or people in Northern Michigan who don't know anything about this, um, what would you say to them? Why, why is it so important for them to know this? And then um, not just Michigan, but the whole right. country. Well, the explosion was part of our history. It took out 38 children. 38 families were destroyed, were up, you know, they were torn apart. Um, it's an important part of our history. Uh, there's other disasters, other, other, like the Civil War. You know, that wasn't pleasant but it's part of the history of the United States. And people need to know about that. That's what our, fu our future is based on our past. And so we need to keep the word out. We don't try to glorify it. 
by all means. But it is important for people to know that this happened. It is still today the worst school massacre involving children of any of all time. There has been no other where 38 children have been killed all at the same time. And that's not something that we're proud of, but you know, with all the school shootings, all the um, 911, the Oklahoma bombing, you know, it just, it's just important to us that people know about it and that we came out strong, that we're a good, strong community. People care about each other. Um, and we want people to know about our, our museum too, because it not, it's not just about the school disaster. Our museum is a history of our school district, different events that have happened, uh, sports, cheerleaders, bands. We have pictures, class pictures starting in 1892, clear up through the current, uh, I think 1973 is the, the highest we've gotten so far, class composites. Everybody that graduated from here, we have their class pictures here in our museum. Um, it's just really important for us, for people to know of our history. Um, we do have, there are four books that are available okay. that we sell for fundraiser. Uh, uh, there's one, the original book called The Bath Massacre. It was written at the time of the explosion. Monty Ellsworth, uh, who was a citizen and helped clear the school, um, he's the one that wrote it. And for the time period, it was really well done, has pictures of everybody that was involved in it, a little bit of story about the disaster. Uh, the next one was called May Day. Grant Parker, who was a teacher, uh, wrote that one. The next one that came out was by Arnie Bernstein. It was the Bath Massacre. And then he has since, um, last year, he wrote an updated version of that one. So there's actually two. Um, and then uh, Amy, can't think of her last name. That's okay. I, I'm sure I can look it okay. up. Okay, yeah, it's on her book right over there. Um, she, uh, I keep trying to say Amy Grant, she was a singer. <laughs> um, she did her uh, dis dissertation on that. She, in the, uh, she lived in Georgia. She was going to the university there. She was majoring in journalism. Okay. Her take on it and her dissertation was how the media was how the media handled it, what they did right, what they did wrong. Very well written book. I sat up till two o'clock in the morning reading her book. Um, and that one is available. We sell that one. We have t-shirts that can be ordered. Uh, all the books can be bought online? They can, uh, well, no, well, you can order them. Okay. Um, uh, order them through us or uh, call us. Go to our uh, our email address, and I'll have to. Uh, Would it be okay to put the number for the museum and the email in the article? Just to oh, contact yeah, the yeah. the The number that people are supposed to call for this is actually the superintendent's office. Okay. Uh, and then they contact us. So we have a website through the school, uh, through the Bath School, Bath Community School. And if you get into that, the, on the front page, there's a, on the sidebar, a place where it can go into the Bath School Museum. Okay. Um, yep. And I'll give you the website, because okay. I can never remember it. And I think it's bath.museum, or bath schools, bath. Okay. And then 1927. Yeah, I don't need it now. Yeah, I okay. Friends Facebook, yeah, so okay. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and any t any Facebook thing you go into, we have you can go into Baskell Museum. Have you gone into any of those? I just the group. Um, I remember I posted in that once. Okay, yeah. If you go into the uh, Facebook page, Baskell Museum, there's a lot of stuff in there. Okay. So, um, yeah.
There we go. Should be fixed. Time. Old S truth. Can, uh, can you spell that for me? E S C H T R U T H. All right. So um, Susan was telling me that uh, your fathers were brothers, correct? All right. Right. So tell me a little bit about uh, your father and what you heard over the years about. Well, my dad was uh, the oldest of uh, nine kids. Uh, he was born in 1907. He was 20 years old at the time of the disaster. He had graduated from Bath School, but at the time Bath only had 10 grades, so he went through 10th grade. He was picking up odd jobs and working at, with my grandpa at a farm on Webster Road. Webster Road was named after my grandmother, Estrus, because they were the oldest uh, for people on the road when consumers put through electricity and that's how they named the roads. Uh, the, he was working at the farm the day of the disaster and my grandmother got the news and rang the dinner bell because that was always the thing to come in from the fields if there was something happening and it wasn't dinner time. So she and, he and my grandfather came into town which was about a mile away as soon as they could. What did he go through that day? I mean, what would that look like to him? Well, he tells me mostly was that he came and the, the superintendent was still kind of directing what was happening and he went up to the superintendent. Of course, everybody knew everybody and, and uh, he asked, what can I do to help? And he said, well, go across the street to, and get, some, get a, some sheets and start tearing them up for bandages. So my dad headed up there just as Keel drove his truck up and blew up the superintendent and, and himself and uh, Keel. So that's how close I come to not being here. Yeah. I mean, that's got to weigh on you a lot. I mean, if he had been near that car. Yeah. And, and four of his brothers and sisters were actually in the, it, were actually injured, none of them critically, but were injured in the uh, disaster. And his, his oldest uh, brother, who was several years younger was I think maybe a junior in or in school and he uh, he was luckily out walking his girlfriend at the time and my uh, my his older sister my dad's older sister Lucetta was graduating that year and she was at the Methodist Church doing practice graduation so and my dad dad never really talked about what he did afterwards I mean it, that was kind of that was kind of the, you know, you knew it was uh, something really emotional and, and that uh, lived his all his life. Yeah. I mean, over the years, did he ever bring it up to you at all? If well, he would tell the story mostly like I've just told it because, uh, but, uh, and, and it was my, oh, I think he said my, uh, would be, be Susan's dad, Raymond, uh, he remembered that he had, injured his leg and that he was nearby when this, out in the uh, schoolyard when the uh, old, uh, truck blew up. And even though he was injured, everybody was so scared not to know what happened that he, he was on a broken leg. He cr crawled across the street to uh, a house to get help or to, to be away for good safety. And um, I mean, the community, it's a very small community, so I mean, everybody, you, like you said, everybody knew everybody. So I imagine what it looked like afterwards was people coming to help. Didn't know what was going on, yep. but they jumped right into it. I mean, what, was, what do you think that says about community? Well, I'm, my, my, you know, my dad and the family knew everybody because they were, they were farmers. And, but my, da my grandfather <laughs> did some farmers markets and, and stuff, but they, and they were well known in the area. Uh, my um, my dad had actually uh, say did some odd jobs for a keyhole like you know helping him put a roof on and, and things like that just to get some extra funds because at the time he uh, later on in a couple of years he went to work for Oldsmobile but then at the time he was just helping his dad and doing odd jobs and it must have been 
Um, I think so. Susan's uh, father was the younger brother, correct? Yeah, he was. Uh, uh, well, my uncle Walter, that I'm named after, was the uh, was the youngest one uh, that was in it. My aunt Zelma wasn't born yet, so my uncle Walter was probably in about first grade, and his. Uh, way he used to tell it was his room was pretty much devastated and somehow he came to and and, and walked out safely when some of the, his friends were killed in it. And then I think my, my uncle Raymond, which Susan's dad, was the, probably the most seriously injured and he was in the hospital for, um, I'm thinking, s several weeks or more. And how does that I mean, make you feel? I mean, with all the memories of your your uncles over the years, I'm sure... I mean, it goes through your head that they maybe they couldn't have made it that day if, if something... Well, happened. yeah, I think we were all, the whole family was fortunate because they, everybody knew the ones that were killed in it. And, uh, and when my dad, there were, there, well, there were eight in the family at the time before my uh, Aunt Zelma was born, but uh, that was, um, you know, they knew all, the, they, everybody knew everybody. And I, I think it weighed on them all their lives, and I know my dad, when he heard, would hear a loud noise or something, you would begin, become startled or more startled than most of us would. Yeah, I mean, going through something traumatic like that, I'm sure, I mean, any, any pop or any bang would set something off. Yeah. I mean, make you go through, relive that day. Yeah. Um, so what would you want to say to the people in Michigan or even the country that didn't know that this happened? Well, you know, we, 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 we sometimes forget history. Uh, I mean, at, at, at the time that was by far the worst disaster ever in a school and now we've become kind of immune to it almost. I guess we would hope it would be something that we would never, uh, never forget in, in the sense that hopefully Keeping it happen again, or or have some gun laws that that we can't have it happen regularly anymore. Yeah, and um, I mean, when you look at that that list of names of the victims, I mean, what what goes through your head? Well, I guess just thankfully it wasn't my dad, and I'm here. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine not. It not being there or being more directly involved in it, what it would be like, no. And uh, why do you think it's so, I mean, we come in here and we see these pictures, why do you think it's so important to show the faces, to, to memorialize the victims? Well, it's kind of like the Holocaust, you know, I don't think we, I don't think we should ever forget those or let it go into history or being, people think it's false news or didn't happen. It's hard to believe that something this terrible would happen in small Hope, town. Hopefully we learn from history, but I, I, I really, thinking back on it, I don't know how you would, a person as deranged as Kehoe was, uh, how you're going to really, because everybody trusted him from what I've read and known about him, and he was uh, on the school board, and he was electrician, and he was doing all this free electrical work for the, for the school, and and, but I think luckily, it only of what I've read about it, only about a third of the dynamite went off because he expected to come and see the whole, the whole thing devastated. And I think he was shocked to see the superintendent alive yet, who I'm sure that he had a lot of hatred to if he was going to come up next to him and blow him up. Yeah. And I guess he was so concerned about taxes. and Well, I, he had a lot of personal problems, but I'm sure that the, t the taxes is what, and the school stuff is what he put it out to. And you don't want to, I mean, believe that evil exists in the world, but this man was... R right. But I don't know how, even today, with all the mass shootings and stuff, how we, how we, how we stop that, even though we know from history that, well, I guess, <laughs> we know that guns do it, <laughs> and especially the assault rifles. But, I mean, dynamite, that's, that's more powerful than a lot of explosives, even nowadays. Right. I mean, well, I don't think anybody would dream what he was doing. They thought he was just upgrading the, the electrical system for free. I think that's what, what and he, I think he had pretty much free roam of the school and what, what he was doing. Yeah. 
crazy to think about. Um, I guess, sorry, I have a list of questions here that I, I don't have any other questions, but is there anything that you want to say that you think that we missed that you want to say about your well, family? Or? Well, the, my, my mother came to teach here two years after in 1929, and then, uh, uh, that's how she met my dad, but uh, and that's how she knew uh, my aunt and uncles that were all involved in the in in the uh, disaster. Okay. So then, thanks, Walt. Okay. Appreciate it. Great. So, is it something that I can get a copy of the doc the documentary or whatever you're doing? Uh, I can get a link. I'm not sure when it's going to air yet. But okay. um, I have Susan on Facebook, and we're, we'll be in contact. So. Okay, well, she yep. can get me whatever. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, I wish you. Uh, wish you the best with it. Yeah, thank you. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Thanks for sitting down. So you can uh, you can just look at me, pretend like the camera's not here. Okay. Conversation. Not a problem. You can uh, say and spell your first and last name for me. First name is Dean, D-E-A-N. Last name is Sweet, S-W-E-E-T. And um, how many family members of yours were survivors? How many family members? Mm -hmm. Direct family? Yeah. My father. Okay. His name was Dean Sr. Tell me a little bit about your, your father. What was he like? <laughs> Just like any other father. No, he was, I, you know, I had a good father. Uh, raised good. Uh, uh, he had some, it was a school explosion. He had some, uh, you know, bad times in life, but uh, he got through it. So, uh, Yeah. What did he, did he tell you anything about that day? Did he? He he uh, he didn't say anything about that day for years to me or anybody else. Uh, there was a lot of uh, trauma, and I don't think he wanted to talk to him. I know he didn't want to talk too much about it because uh, uh, I'd ask him questions and couldn't get answers. And I think there was a lot of 
children of that age at that time, uh, growing up in life, they didn't talk about it too much. Uh, and Dad really didn't uh, didn't uh, talk uh, a whole lot about it until probably, well, he was on the committee for this, this museum that we're here at, and uh, he asked me if I'd, you know, come and join the committee, and uh, I uh, kind of uh, gave him a hard time for a little while and told him no, I wasn't interested and things like that. And uh, finally, I he talked me into coming down at least to one of the meetings and see how things were going. And I said, "Okay, I'll, I'll do it for you." So we rode together, you know, and uh, rode down to the rode down to the museum here and had and they had their meeting and everything. And I listened in and everything. And uh, on the way home, he says, "Well, what'd you think?" And uh, I said, "Well, it's interesting." You know, but I'm not saying yes yet, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe a couple more meetings. Let's see, maybe if I go to a couple more, if I decide to go. And he says, okay, I'll give you that, you know. So next meeting come up, and we rode together. And, uh, you know, I, I was uh, a little more informative about what, what was happening down here, so I... You know, I'd come with him the next time and got a little more interested in it, you know, and uh, I finally told him on the way home that, yeah, I would uh, join their committee and help out where I could. So I've been here ever since. But uh, I found out that uh, at uh, meetings that we went to following that, that uh, uh, I'd ask him a question once in a while and on the way to the meeting or on the way home, and he'd open up a little bit about it. And uh, so I finally decided, well, maybe it's a good thing I joined the committee. And uh, he opened up a little more to me as time went on. And I found out a few things that, uh, that he wouldn't talk about before. And I understand why he wouldn't talk about them. It's very traumatic. Oh, sure. He was in the hospital probably for three or four months, I guess. Uh, and uh, just, you know, laying around hurt. He had he had a metal plate put in his skull because part of his skull was busted out from the dynamite. And he had a metal plate put in his, in his, dumb, in his shins because he lost part of that. So back then... When they fixed you up like that, I guess they used metal. So he had he had that, you know, uh, done. And finally, the doctors told 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 his mother and dad, "You might just well take him home, put him in his own bedroom, and you know, you know, if he's going to die, let him die in his own bed." Well, that was kind of traumatic for my dad to hear, you know. But uh, so they took dad home and put him in his bedroom, you know, and I don't know, I can't remember right now how long he said he laid in his bed at home, but uh, come, uh, you know, summertime, springtime, it was, it, uh, they lived on a big farm. There was 12 in his family, and they lived on a big dairy farm, and uh, he was looking out his window one day, and his dad had a team of horses out there plowing the field. And uh, Dad just told me, he says, I got up and put my clothes on, put my boots on. And he says, part of my job was when Dad was plowing, I'd had to go pick the rocks out of the furrows, you know, and toss them over the side. And he said, so I went out and started doing that. Well, his dad didn't see him doing that because his dad was plowing away from him. And so his back was turned to, to my dad, you know, and... Uh, turned his team of horses around and started back towards my dad with uh, his, with his horses and uh, got up to my dad and stopped the team of horses and said, what are you doing out here? I said, I'm doing my job. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I think it was about uh, 
12 years old, 11, 12 years old at that time, you know. And uh, the doctors really didn't expect him, much, I guess, to live, you know, very long once he got home. But uh, and uh, he lived to be 92 years old. So. Was he in the initial blast or the when the car? Oh, he was in the he was in the initial blast. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure it goes through your head all the time that if more of that dynamite had exploded, I mean, you might not be sitting here with me today. That's true. That's very true. Yeah, you know, he was he was taking a test and uh, he was on the lower floor and the top floors to come down on him. You know, all the cement and uh, and uh, steel girders and all that, and they and it pinned him for. He was was one of the last ones that they took out, and uh, you know. Uh, he said, I, he said, I thought I heard somebody say, well, we're done guys, let's go. And, uh, you know, and, uh, so. How long would, do you think he would have been pinned under there for? Do you know if he? Oh, he, uh, I, I don't. I mean, I'm sure it was a blur. Yeah. He never, he never said how long it was. It was just pinned, you know, and, uh, but, uh, he said, I don't know why they come back. He says, uh. I tried to make some noise and I couldn't do anything, you know. So, but he said they still found me. So, Did your father have any friends that died in the explosion? Oh, if he did, if they were, I'm sure there were friends. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a small school district, but I'm, I'm sure he had friends, but he didn't talk about them. Why do you think it's so important to memorialize the victims here? I see the photos up there. Why do you think it's so important to remember? Why do I think it's so important? I think that uh, this has to live on through through us kids. We we need to we need to see that they're recognized. We need to tell the story, and uh, and. It, it just, it wasn't told before. It wasn't told by them uh, as, as much as it should have been because they didn't talk about it. It was one of those things that you just don't talk about. And we're trying to uh, know and let people know the history of the, of the bombing. And for people like me who had never heard about this until like a couple months ago, uh -huh. um, people in northern Michigan, across the country, who just don't know, what would you want to say to them? Uh, I think people are starting to hear more, more people are starting to hear more about it now. Uh, and some of it, I think, is because of some of the disasters that are happening today. And uh, it's, uh, it's just, it's one of those things that if, if the, if if we can tell people what happens, maybe we can maybe we can stop what's going on today. Um, I think that's all the questions I had. Is there anything else you want to say? Other than no, just uh, you know, uh, we want to keep our museum going. Perfect. Thanks, Dean. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so you can... Uh, Does, can this sit on the floor? Yeah, yep. Keep sliding off. <laughs> All right, so you can just look at me, pretend like the camera's not here. I know it's hard to do because it's staring you right in the face, but um, you can say and spell your first and last name for me. Michelle Allen, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-A-L-L-E-N. And um, how many family members of yours are survivors? Oh, you make me count. All right. Twins. Five survived and one was killed. Okay. Um, immediate family members? My dad and his siblings. 
were either of his siblings killed in the blast? Five survived and then one was killed. His brother, Floyd, was killed in the explosion. Aunt Gertie was buried in it, but she, they got her out. Um, Uncle Royal jumped from an upper window to a second, to a, a first floor roof and hurt his knees, so that bothered him the rest of his life. He always had leg problems. And the twins, Aunt Winnie and Aunt Wani, were in a car in the vicinity of Kehoe's truck when he blew it up. And they were witness to the conversation that Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Hike had uh, concerning Mr. Hike was asking uh, Mr. Kehoe, we need ladders, can you help us get ladders? And Mr. Hike called him over and in the midst of everything as Mr. Hike was moving around and Mr. Hike took a second look at Kehoe's face and he said, you know something about this, don't you? And then Mr. Kehoe blew up the truck, taking out other people too. But Aunt Winnie and Aunt Wani were in another vehicle, unharmed, and witness to that conversation. Um, how much did your family members talk about this? They didn't. Um, I think at some time in my life, as a, growing up as a child, I think it finally, I've heard about it, but I didn't even hear enough about it to think to ask questions at the time. But as I got older, then I started finding out more, especially when Daddy wrote the book, uh, wrote his book about the township, and then I began to be aware of it. And then as he got older, I learned more and more. Uh, never from the rest of the family, though, because by then they were older and lived in Florida and lived all around the country, and some had died. So it was just Dad and his memories that I was able to learn about. And what did he say about um, his, his brother that passed away? What, did he have any stories? Or he did. His brother was about three years older than him and was a husky build. My father was a small build and younger, and the kids would pick on him, and Floyd would come along and protect him, chase off the bullies and protect Dad. And then Daddy said that Floyd played on the baseball team and he was so good that, uh, I don't remember the details if the high school team had him try out or not or something, but he was so good he felt that he would have been a major baseball player as an adult if he had lived. He was very proud of Floyd and he really missed him when he was gone because they were closer in age. There were nine in my dad's family and Floyd was next, three years older. So. I mean, that must have been hard for your dad to, I mean, he was, it was just a normal day at school. I mean, they were excited for summer. Yeah. To lose his brother that day. And yeah. That must have been hard. And he doesn't have, he didn't tell me his, anything about the families I have learned through other sources about Uncle Royal jumping out of the window and Aunt Gertie being buried and Winnie and Wani being in the car and it's taken other sources to learn all of that to put it together but Daddy did talk about um, being on the farm a day or two after the explosion and they had a parcel of land that was ran between Clark and Drumheller, uh, their 80 acre parcel. And uh, he watched a plane come in and land in the field. It was reporters coming. Uh, that was an interesting. Must have been frenzy of people coming in to see what happened. And the road was packed, I'm told, yeah. Just a gravel road at that time. That was all the 
but looking at all the faces up there in that wall, I mean, when you look at that, what do you, what goes through your head? Mm. I'm always caught by all the names that are still here. I, I like that, to think that the families uh, have a history here. As part of their history, it's a sad part. There were a couple families that actually moved away after losing their children, but <clears throat> for the most part, there's quite a few that still are in the community or that were in the last 50 years still in the community. And what do you say, want to say about, um, I mean, these kids were just getting started with their lives. I mean, they didn't really have well, hopefully they were killed quickly. Aunt Gertie, when she was buried in the rubble, someone kept kicking her. And they kicked and kicked. It was kind of a rhythmic kicking. It wasn't uh, fast. And I don't think it was very hard, but just an irritation. And after a while, she just said, would you please quit? And they did quit because they died. So I don't know if that child suffered. I, it was a quick explosion, so I pray that they all, most all quickly died. Hate to think of the children suffering. And you don't want to believe that there's evil in the world, but Oh, I believe there's evil in the world. Evil runs the world. I have no doubt about that. And what this man did is unspeakable. <clears throat> Daddy did tell me a lot about Mr. Kehoe's farm and how he treated everything, killed everything and destroyed everything and wired everything up for explosion and the neighbors went in to try and, well, neighbors saw the house burning and they went in to try and rescue some stuff and pulled the piano out from the wall and it was loaded with dynamite behind the piano and they just whirled and left. And I've heard other stories of dynamite under the rugs and behind other pieces of furniture. And then um, what he did to his wife is just, I don't know. It's it's really horrid. Um, why do you think it's so important to to show the faces and to memorialize mm. all the children and all the victims? Oh, they deserve to be remembered. They they had a life. They would have lived. Um, many there. There were many survivors and went on to do live wonderful lives, have families, and. Um, I don't think it should be buried. I don't think it should be um, glorified in any way. It's a, it's a tough part of a phrase I often say is life is life. That's kind of an extreme <laughs> example. That's, you know, you stub your toe, life is life. You get cancer, life is life. It's just, you get a married and have children, children and parents that die, and life goes on. But they shouldn't be forgotten. Yeah. I mean, what do you think the community would have been like this had never happened if these kids had grown up and had a future, I'm sure. Mm. I mean, what do you think would the community look like if, if this had never happened? Mm. I think we'd have been a bigger community because it was growing. We had a lot of businesses downtown. We had a lot of prosperous farms. It was uh, just before the Depression. So between the explosion and the depression, the community really shrank. It was really hurt. But um, at that time, I th it was an up and coming little town. 
it would have had a bigger dot on the map. <laughs> um, what would you want to say to people out there? I mean, like me, maybe a couple months ago that didn't know anything about this. Um, um, people in Michigan or in the country, I mean, about these kids and, and why they should know about this. I've done, often done that. And it, the conversation always starts wherever the comments came from. Uh, they say, where's Bath? Well, it's north of Lansing. And somebody else will come up and, well, I've heard about this story. And can you tell me about it? And um, If they don't know anything and they're curious and interested, I go ahead and tell them uh, that this happened. And, the more time is given to telling the story, the more details we give. But sometimes it's just a quick telling. But um, generally, don't say too much about the Mr. Kehoe. Yeah. One thing I have often told people is that we have been in touch with the Kehoe family. And that's been sweet because they're not to blame at all. And we have never shared where they are and who they are because that wouldn't be right to them either. But they're a very nice family, very nice people, very normal people. <laughs> Is there anything else that you? I'm pleased we have this committee that tries to carry the story forward accurately. And also includes all of the school in our museum, not just that one horrible day. Thank you. Thank you.